goodness, we're live, we're live, we're here. It finally happened. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your patience with our technical difficulties. And we're, ugh, welcome to the very first episode of The Kids Are Asleep. I am your host, Jamila Lemieux. And I basically finesse these nice people at Slate and giving me a platform to do hood rat things with my friends, talk a little bit of shit, and spread my feminist pop mom agenda uh, from the comfort of my own home. That smooth ass intro music was all a facade. Uh, welcome to the Terror Dome. It's gonna get scary in here. I'm kidding. Um, I'm so excited to have you all here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I don't know how you ended up watching in the first place, but I'm very grateful that you did and ask that you please don't leave. I'll just say that I am a writer, a survivor of the feminist blog era, era, uh, not a Freudian slip, who managed to create kind of a unique career um, from talking to people on the internet about my thoughts and feelings. And I've written for a lot of publications that you all may have heard of, one of them, of course, being Slate. I am a contributor to the Karen Feeding Parenting column, and I'm one of the co-hosts of Mom and Dad are Fighting, Slate's parenting podcast, along with Dan Kwa and Elizabeth Newcamp. You can learn all about my previous work at jamilalemieux.com uh, if you're into that sort of thing, especially if you're looking to book some paid gigs, because Corona has definitely hit every creative that I know's pockets pretty hard. So that booking page is live and waiting for you and your coins. Um, so listen, The Kids Are Sleep is a very fun show. I have a teleprompter. Can I just tell you, I'm so motherfucking professional that I have a teleprompter. The problem is I have yet to master the proper speed for reading a teleprompter. So I was like, okay, it's moving way too slow. I got to stop. And then uh, I sped it up and then it was moving too fast. So we'll go back into it. Um, I, not that I don't know exactly what I want to talk to you about, which is the show, The Kids Are Asleep, which is a fun evening talk show uh, dressed in the parenting show's clothing. But please tell your friends who don't have kids, those lucky bastards, that uh, they're more than welcome to tune in. We're going to talk about all types of stuff, much more than parenting. We're going to drink, we're going to get high, and we're going to have a lot of fun um, from home during a time which most of our fun is taking place at home. So. Please tell all your friends to tune in, especially your friends who are eligible bachelors over six feet tall. Uh, and that's not me discriminating against men who are under six feet tall. In fact, most men between the heights of 5'10 and 5'11 identify as six feet tall, and I'm open to them as well, uh, as long as they can take it a little bit and let them know that I, um, I have a job of sorts and I've got motherly experience under my belt and I am ready and waiting for the next love of my life. I've actually been trying to find love during COVID via the dating apps, which is pretty sad. And you may be wondering why exactly would I wait until now to do that? It's not that I wasn't trying to do it before, but now I can just say I'm, I'm only here because of COVID, but we all know that those profiles existed for a very long time. Um, but part of the urgency that I have now behind trying to find a relationship is because I can't go through COVID-21 by myself. Um, this has been very challenging. Uh, and when COVID-21 hits, I'm going to need somebody to take care of me. Celibacy goes against my religion. It goes against every bit of my moral code. I am tired of cooking. I am tired of cleaning. And then there's entertaining uh, my little person. I give it up to anyone who is taking care of their children 100% of the time, no matter how many adults you have in your household, because these little motherfuckers are unrelenting. My child is either ignoring me and watching Peppa Pig or trying to literally get back inside of my womb. There's no middle ground. Uh, speaking of my womb, I've got about 10 minutes left before these eggs are no good, and I'm thinking about using one of them before I shut the whole place down. I should probably tell you about my pre-existing motherhood condition. Uh, I have a be beautiful and brilliant seven-year-old daughter, Naima, AKA Mini Mila, as I refer to her on the internet. I happily co-parent her with my uh, former boyfriend, his now wife, and we agreed to do a joint relocation um, from Brooklyn, New York, where we were all living to Los Angeles, California late last year. Of course, we do not live in the same house because that would just be crazy. And Naima divides her time between my home and theirs. And she has a five-year-old brother there, which is great because I haven't had any pressure to scramble one of these remaining eggs. Um, I can do it at my leisure because 35-year-old woman, of course, has forever fertility. 
Anyway, the kids are asleep. The kids are asleep. The kids are asleep. It's going to be me, Mommy the Stallion, getting a little bit tipsy, uh, telling some jokes, talking to some fascinating folks, many of whom will be parents, some of whom will not, about pop culture and politics and life and family and trying to make it in the era of COVID. Now, I want you to get tipsy with me too. So each week we're going to be playing a drinking game. This I'm excited about. This week's game, I want you to take a drink every time I or my guest says the word child or children, kid or kids, son, daughter, or the name of one of their children. So basically, we're going to have to get creative in how we refer to our children, or we're going to get drunk, and you're going to get drunk too. I'm hoping for the latter. So with that, I'm so excited to introduce our very first guest for The Kids Are Asleep. Roy right. Wood Jr. First, the man, first guest first ever first in the history and of this show. First. You need to put this on your wiki page. The, I, somebody people. else would do it for me. I I don't okay. touch my Wikipedia. My Wikipedia, like the last I checked, it was people arguing over whether or not I was born in New York or Birmingham. So whatever. Well, what is the truth? New York. But I was raised down south. We left New York when I was eight months old, so that ain't long enough to claim New York. But I claim Birmingham so hard, everybody think I was born there, which I ain't gonna stop you from saying. Uh, good to see you. Thank you for having me. Um, I have a little Thank bit of a uh, drink here myself uh, as well. Okay. Uh, little I've sip, got my drink. Little I've sip. got two. Little sip, sip. I got two. I got a mixed drink for just regular okay. sipping, and I've got some Crown. For taking shots when you make okay. reference to um, I, how many I think, small I people think are in your house? This is very intense. This is an intense challenge you've set up for yourself here, and I don't want to be responsible for getting you fucked up on your inaugural your inaugural show. I have one, I have one person with which I have paternal genetic ties. Is that a crafty way to not say child or kid? Oops! Now shot, you have to take shot, two shot, shots. Shot, shot. No, Rhett, Roy, you yeah. have to take two shots too. This is a communal drinking game. This is not just. I'm not doing. I'm not too. doing shots with your ass. I got shit to live for too. We're I'm, not taking a whole shot. You taking shots drink. every Thursday night for an hour straight? Yeah, trust me. I've done road comedy for years. I've seen what weekly drinking does to strangers. Weekly drinking. Weekly. Yes. Yes. You're not drinking weekly right now under coronavirus. Nah, you know what's crazy? Like, I this is probably this is gonna sound messed up. I haven't been this creatively productive since that semester I flunked a bunch of classes in college. Oh wow! Where I've had so much time to just focus on things, and you know, I'll sit with some friends, but just drinking around the house—that's not the norm for me. Like, this is my like prime productivity time. And I don't know if that's just the creative juices are on or if it's just fiscal paranoia, but whatever it mm-hmm. is, it has me motivated. And I'm at the age now I'm, I'm 40, you know, so you drink now. It ain't, a, it ain't about just, can I get drunk tonight? It's do I have enough room to recover over the next 36 hours after drinking? And more often than not, the answer is no. It's not that I don't want to drink. It's just, I got shit to do tomorrow. So I can't do it tonight. I understand. I understand. And for the yeah. record, even though it is earlier where I am, it's seven o'clock where I am. This is my social activity for the night, if not the the week. So I'm not drinking like this on a regular. First of all, I smoke way too much weed to be drinking on a regular basis. You can't have both. You got you that can't. weed smoking lighting in the background there. I can tell. I can tell. And I you mean that I mean that respectfully. I don't I'm not saying that in a disrespectful way. It's just That's certain what? houses and backgrounds. I'll be peeping people's Zoom backgrounds on, on the TV. I'd be like, they smoke weed. They ain't got enough books back there. <laughs> I got mad books in here, but you are correct in calling out uh, the <laughs> weed smokers home. The probably the faint waft of marijuana deep in the uh, wait, you know what's funny? So I have a neighbor who at who, you know, I'm friendly with and he was like, Oh, if you ever want to come smoke on my patio, um, you know, we both have patios, but like, yo, if you ever want to come over here and smoke, you're more welcome. I was like, Oh, I smoke in the house. And he said, You and your landlord made an arrangement? 
and I stopped for a long time. And it never occurred to me that if I smoked yeah. weed in my house almost every day, that there's going to be a smell that I leave when yeah. I leave here. Yeah, that's, that's all in the up. carpet. Stanley Steamer can't help you. Your security deposit gone. You in LA, they need a reason gone. to take your security <laughs> deposit. You just gave me one too. Yeah, I'm like, this, gone. Is, this apartment, I'm like Tina leaving Ike. All I want is my name. You can take this shit, you can take my security <laughs> deposit, you can take this furniture. Uh, I'm just ready to get on out of here. But uh, we can talk about my living situation a little bit later. Uh, I do feel it's um, appropriate for me to ask some relation, uh, some questions of you that are related to your parenting of the small person who is, what did you say, of your, uh, he shared your DNA. Of, of paternal descent. The person of paternal descent that resides in your home. Uh, you have a four year old. Yeah, yeah. What does a four What does a four year old understand about coronavirus? Like, what's his concept of like why life is some bullshit right now? We haven't gotten into the weeds with him. Sesame Street had some shit that was pretty dope. Um, mm -hmm. About two, three weeks ago, it was like Elmo and them, mm -hmm. but it it was more for like seven and eight year olds. The way they were breaking it down. Yeah. Uh, we got them understanding to wear the mask to cover up when the cough. The need for sanitizing and washing their hands. The thing that's been the hardest to get them to unlearn is, you know, he's four. You teach four-year-olds to be friendly and speak and hug and all of that. And we're like, nah, you just can't be running up on strangers trying to give them a hug no more. You yeah. just got to assume everybody got their shit and just leave them alone. Uh, but that's that's all we've explained to him. He's a happy child and learning about plants, the world, letters, numbers, Paw Patrol, you know, the usual stuff. It's just, you know, the little things like if we take him out scootering and he sees another kid with a scooter, the default is to pull up and oh, have a chip another check kid. kid about another kid, kid. That was two kids. <sighs> you give him just some. take a sip. Just, Come on, Gen just, X. You know, Come on, yeah, Gen yeah, X. yeah. And so, whew, thank you, Vodka. Uh, and so basically, they we're, we're trying to teach him how to disassociate the need for immediate physical contact. But you know, it's a work in progress. He's getting there. He's getting there. How? Speaking of work, how has it been trying to create? Because you said you've had more creative time and energy than you have in a very long uh, while, but you've also got a four-year-old in the house. So how does that work when you've got a burst of inspiration and you got some jokes you want to come right down and he's like, did I tell you about the time I skinned my knee three minutes ago and you saw it happen? And I want to tell you all about um, it. I've learned to partition work into stuff that I can do while he's awake so i can be interactive and try to be connected as a parent and then there's certain work that can only happen when he's asleep i've i've learned over months and months of quarantine research that you're not going to be able to write or do anything that's deeply creative in the presence of a four-year-old it just doesn't happen like that which is fine so you have to pick your pockets where okay here's that 10 p.m. Like right now, if I wasn't talking to you, then I could pitch something for the Daily Show or try to tidy up a script I'm trying to sell or something like that. Like this becomes that prime time real estate to try and, you know, get other things accomplished. And, you know, you're learning. I'm learning. We're learning. Please open the schools. It's hard for me. Please, please. Oh, God. No, they can't open the schools up. That's the thing. I know, like, but, as I much as I, but I feel like, but I can schools. pray. I can pray to Jesus. I, yo, I, even if they open the schools back up, I don't know if I could let them go. You no, know? you can't like, let them go. Parents, parents, man. I just, I don't, I would be crushed if he caught something or if, you know, I became asymptomatic because of him, then passed it on to somebody else and they got towed up. Like, that's, that's too much of a price to pay to eat graham crackers and learn colors. Because that's all he's doing. I, I, that's all you're doing it for. I think even though that's you cool. present them a little fun people in bed size so they can radicalize him like we did with Naima. But we can talk about that offline. The African-centered daycare center that I am very enthusiastic about. But um, Is that one of the daycare centers you know, with all the black history heroes on the wall? Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I went to a spot like that in Birmingham a as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's one in Bedside. Little Sun people, the best school in the world. They have a genuine Budweiser Kings and Queens. Great. You remember the Budweiser uh, Great Kings and Queens of Africa um, yeah, posters yeah. that they I would do? That. They would give to the school. But they were, unlike the school I went to, little some people covered up the Budweiser logo, which I appreciate because it's a beautiful piece of artwork. But there's no need to advertise uh, domestic beer to them at two or three <laughs> years old. But it's a, it's a great institution. Um, but I, what I worry about most when I think about going back to school and, and me being just as optimistic as possible and, and just hoping that, you know, Side note, I hope everybody at home doesn't see my internet looking like I had logged on with a Juno disc like it looks to me. I promise you, I have like actual, either I pay for my internet, I'm not stealing it from a neighbor. I can't steal from my neighbor because the, the people upstairs, their Wi-Fi password is nigga please. So they've made it very clear that I'm not allowed to steal it from them. Um, but for some reason, I'm looking a little bit choppy. Uh, we'll, we'll pretty me up for next week. But um. But when I think about sending my kid back to school, what scares me the most um, is the idea of, of a child in her class or in her school or one of their parents or a teacher passing away and what that's going to mean for the entire school community. You know, like just the idea of having to deal with the death that close. And there's the likelihood we black. So people we know have died. You know, there, there's a unfortunate chance that people we know are going to um, continue to get sick and, and hopefully survive. But it, it just feels too likely that something like that could happen. You know, I think that's what you fall yeah. asleep. Yeah, I just don't think that I it's I just don't think that it's going to be a quick solution. And they're already child, shutting down sorry. colleges. They're already shutting down colleges. They're already starting to shut down football and stuff like that. And as higher education goes, eventually so goes public education. And, you know, you can see what they're saying in the media where they're trying to hold out hope and threatening these teachers and school systems where you ain't going to get no federal funds if you don't open up. The, yeah. it, eventually, everyone's going to see what the right thing is to do. And you should, you're just going to be stuck with your kids. That's just what it's going to be. The thing that I really pray for are the children who eat better at school than they do at home because of their living situation and making sure that those kids at least stay fed. And that's the part of it. That's the human part of it that I think is being lost in all of this political jockeying on the topic. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm blessed enough. I'm blessed enough to be under the roof with my person of paternal descent and yeah. and his mother, you know, my woman, my girl, and we both are blessed enough to be in jobs that give us a level of flexibility and an ability to be home. And you couple that with the fact right. that the Daily Show right now, they're not sending me out on the road to cover a piece. Every right. comedy club in the nation is, is for the most part closed. There's some that are open. I'm not trying to fuck with no stand-up comedy right now. So for the better part of from now till the end of the year, I predict I'll be in New York City more than I'll be at the airport. So if that's the case, right. if there's ever a scenario, you know, I'm blessed, you know, for my son to be able to be home. Now, I'm blessed to just watch him. I don't feel like learning. I'm going to be real with you. This e-learning shit, man. I, yo, man. Like, let me, let me just... A salute to all the teachers and the level of patience that you have to display when you're trying to teach these people how to, to count and read and phonics and just shit, man. Like, cause I got a solution. We need to just give these kids a buy year on learning. American kids not learning shit no way. So like, no. Why? Why even I, pretend? Like, like just no. Mm, here's my fear. If you got a kid that's reading on the first grade level, then you give them a whole year off, they're going to be back on preschool blues clues ass reading. If you ain't care. That's my concern. I, what I really... What just I really worry if they're on... Are they going to learn it? The distance learning. I think the kids that are most in danger of, of losing a reading level if they don't have regular in, uh, instruction are also the kids that are most vulnerable in terms of not having the sort of setup at home where they can get quality distance learning. That's what well, I'm worried about. I should say, about... no. let me clear. They shouldn't, I'm not saying that the kids shouldn't have school. I'm saying it shouldn't count. 
Yeah, that's fair. Like, because this should be like an exhibition equal. match. We just playing. Yeah, it's not equal for every kid. Like right now in um back home in Alabama, they have school buses that are serving as Wi Fi hotspots in um yeah. in underserved areas. Like the internet ain't no regular shit in a lot of these rural counties across America. You still getting the internet by satellite, that shit is choppy. You ain't on no Zoom lecture with your teacher. And if you are, you gotta drive and sit in your mama's car beside a fucking school bus. Yeah just to download your homework for the day, assuming that your mama ain't in the car at fucking work because on her way to work. Yo, man, this is it's this crazy, is a which is issue and you know, it's terrible. I just, and, it, and these, mm. I was just gonna say the, the grades shouldn't count. I, I think that we should absolutely continue to give children instruction. I think. Uh, every state, every local school district should be making um, efforts toward getting kids Wi-Fi in their homes. It has been done. You know, it can be done in every state in the nation, providing Wi-Fi to homes of children that are enrolled in public schools who do not afford it. You know, they, they uh, our, my daughter was given a, a tablet. You know, she has a tablet, but she was provided one um, by her school to use. Uh, one, it's the only one that you can use to access the school's homework set, set up because the other thing is we got small kids you know even at first and second grade there's only so much that they're thinking about in terms of access to cheating or things like that you know if you have a high school student they're worried about you using your personal devices because you could be doing something improprietous uh which i think is the wrong concern during a pandemic but i understand but either way mm -hmm. I, I think that we should be providing all these kids with the tools they need to do distance learning we should be taking attendance and making sure that they're participating in it I don't think their grades should count. I think this should, or this needs to be pass fail, you know, and, and yeah. I, I just yeah. don't think it's fair. You know, I, I don't think it's I'm fair, but uh, let, let's move on from that for a second. I'm curious to know, how has it been for you writing jokes during, in the face of such great calamity because we're not just living through COVID, we're living through the same racism we've always been living through, but now we're in this unique moment where people are pretending that it actually matters and that they care. Um, there, There's a lot, that there's certainly a lot of material right now, but there's also the sadness and the emotional reaction that you, ostensibly as a dad, as a black man, as a human being are experiencing being a part of this right now. So how are you writing? How are you writing your funny stuff? I think that it's about finding the common denominator in the emotion of the moment. Like, like for me, for me, you know, stand up is about finding the opposite. The thing that we all see, but I try to show it to you from a different prism. Where now, it's the thing that we all feel, and just acknowledging that, and being heard, and just letting an audience member know that they're not alone and thinking a particular way. And, you know, that's a lot of what we try to do, you know, with what's going on with The Daily Show. You know, we're trying to find stories where there isn't a lot of humor. I just had a segment that aired earlier this week exploring the Georgia citizen's arrest law, which was ultimately the law mm -hmm. that cost Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Aubrey his life. And so... Mm -hmm when you look at that law and you start examining the origins of the law and how it started back in the slave catching days. And there are jokes around the outer orbits of an issue, but at the core of the issue is things that a lot of people are upset about and a desire to see those things change and see those things, see those rights be wrong. So then the jokes become the jokes I had, you know, with uh, with the Georgia State Representative Carl Gilliard, who's fighting to get the citizens arrest law uh, repealed and off the books in the state of Georgia. So you find jokes on the outer perimeter of an issue that isn't worth joking about, that you shouldn't be joking about. So that's kind of been the, the baby steps and kind of stepping around landmines in a way that we've been doing at The Daily Show. As for my personal standup, you know, I just jot down premises. I've just been cataloging a lot of new ideas and thoughts, but I haven't put anything on stage because it's just, for me, it's not time. Even if the comedy clubs were open and COVID was cured, 
I'm not in a rush to get back on stage just because the landscape is changing so fast. I, that's part of why I think uh, what Chappelle did with 846 um, may become a new style broadcast model for stand-up comedy from the time it's mm-hmm. conceived, from conception to air. Uh, the average stand-up special is usually on an eight, it's usually on an eight month production. You know, we shoot it, we edit it, then we wait patiently for the right time on the calendar to put, ain't no more right time. These jokes might not even be relevant right. in two months. So as soon as or you shoot it- Or completely inappropriate in two months. There you go. So you need to put this shit out, you know, as quickly as possible. You know, there've been some comedians that have had, you know, shorter um, turn times and I think that's gonna be the norm. Uh, Yvonne Orgy just had an HBO special. She shot in mm-hmm. February. It aired, I think, three or four months later, somewhere around Mother's Day, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So that's a very short runway. But even that now might be too long of a runway. So I was going to say. Three months is a long time. It's crazy to think that. You know, my two specials, I shot with Comedy Central. There was like fucking eight to ten months of lead time on that. I shot it. And then by the time it aired, I forgot I shot it. Thankfully, the joke still held up, but I just think that we're in a society is changing too fast and moving too fast. And I just think that, you know, it's a prime opportunity for comedians where they're going to have to be comfortable with pulling, putting ideas on stage before they're ready for them and just trust that the audience, you know, is with you. You know, I, um, I was listening to Questlove's podcast. Uh, Quest Love Supreme. It was an older episode from a couple years ago where he interviewed or they interviewed Chris Rock. And he talked about, you know, the fundamental difference between being a touring musician and a touring comedian, right? Which is that uh, you can perform the same song for years and years and years and you can have one album. You know, Lauren Hill could tour for the rest of her life and never record another piece of music. She don't have to be on time. And yet, like, she will continue to be able to sell, you know, sell tickets to shows from that one album. And, you know, um, even if she doesn't do any of the Fuji's material, any of the guest appearances, just that album. When you're a comedian, people are expecting new and different jokes. You can't do, you can't just take bigger and blacker on tour. Okay, like, I'm going to tell all them jokes again. Remember how much you laughed the first time? We're going to do that, you know, for the city. With a special, it's this is a tour you you've been on tour usually, right? For most people, this mm-hmm. is that you've been on tour, um, and I guess other times it's that you've created material for the special. But typically, yeah, it's you shot it for a year material. and a half, right? So there's all of that time. Thinking about how concerts, uh, musical concerts, are going to have to go online for uh, musicians to continue to feed themselves, right? They're going to have to figure out a way to sell merchandise, sell downloads sell tickets to or work with partners that will sponsor online experiences where you can hear them perform their music. In theory, comedians are going to also have to get in the hand, and there certainly have been many of them that have been using Zoom and Twitch and Instagram and various platforms to present comedic material that they would have otherwise been performing on a stage somewhere for a, a live audience. Do you think that we're going to start seeing specials happen that way? Or do you think, I mean, because you have, again, all of the work and the time, the effort, and then the thought that goes into having 45 or 60 minutes of comedy, you know, um, that, that is now on a Netflix or an Amazon or a Comedy Central. But we don't have that, like you said, the, the possibilities are, are not, are for that going wrong are so many at this point. There's also this audience that's at home bored, dying for some shit to laugh at. I don't think comedy, in a, I don't think stand-up comedy in the long in the long run benefits from being showcased and developed in front of people in front of the world. It's bad enough when people come to a comedy club with a camera phone. Uh, comedy is the only yeah. art form that's developed in front of the customer. Like it's it's on some Cold Stone Creamery shit, where <laughs> you see a joke from the beginning, Subway sandwich, if you will, if you've never been to yeah. Cold Stone, and you work it all the way down in front of the world. So once you put it out on Zoom one time and somebody pulls a snippet of that, that joke is burned, it's done. And don't let it be an edgy joke and you didn't quite stick the landing. Because a lot of material that people think is pushing the envelope or it's not PC, 
it probably started in a far uglier place before it got to the polished place where you could even argue yeah. the merits of the material. That type of that type of material has to be incubated somewhere far less open and far less diverse than Zoom or Instagram Live, in my opinion. So you can do something for now, but I think eventually the true spirit of comedy is going to have to go back to the clubs. The bigger question is, will motherfuckers be comfortable going back to the clubs when the clubs open? Because everybody talks about the world reopening. It's going to be two reopenings. It's going to be when they say it's open, and then it's going to be when motherfuckers feel comfortable actually showing up because it's open. And, you know, it's people or going when out they in should Florida. Feel comfortable. When it- I was gonna say we had that choice. in California. It opened and had to close back up because it wasn't time yet. Yeah, like even it like I'll be back. I'll keep it one hundred with you. When the COVID vaccine hit, I ain't finna be in the first wave of motherfuckers getting that first wave of Corona vaccine. No, no, I can't do you that. Never shit. The, you never do the first iPhone update. You wait for the second one. You wait for that point two. You don't get the point one. You don't. I didn't even do the first iPhone. So, I had, I was still using a Blackberry for a few years. Like, I don't know okay. that whole Apple making a phone thing is going to work out for you. Prove it. Exactly. So I just don't know when that's going to be. So, you know, you do what you can in the meantime. And there are a lot of comedians that are seeing a lot of success doing stand up online. Stylistically, it doesn't feel comfortable for me. But then you have comments that have figured out entirely new lanes the homie z-way fumido like z-way is out here killing the game right now with live interview shows that would have never happened had she not been in quarantine like it, it's just right. this quarantine is going to change how you think about reaching people but if you are a comedian then you will figure out what the rules are of these new para- what the parameters are of this new world that we're in and figure out a way to still attack and still you know spread your comedy to the world i just think the avenues of traditional stand-up, they're just not going to be feasible for everyone. Chappelle did a show in the park, but he's also Chappelle. How many of you other people are that, like people going to go see in the park? And even if they do come see you, what's going to happen when winter comes? Are people still right. coming outside after November, or are you right. like so? You know, I don't know. I just I, I'm just going to wait and see. I think we're also going to have like I mean like with what Z-Way is doing, we're going to have to learn to live this way. You know, we're, I think we're going to have to learn to live this way again, that even when there is a vaccine, even when enough time has passed that folks feel comfortable taking it, that we can prepare to be in a situation where we're all indoors uh, over and over again, maybe hopefully for shorter periods of time. And I think about Zoom comedy shows, you know, and concerts where it's like, yeah, it's not in front of the entire internet, but you've got, you know, this, small audience of ticket holders and people who, you know, under normal circumstances, this would be your comedy seller, or this would be the 930 Club in DC, you know, and I'm not just talking about for comedians, but performers in general, the same way that for, I make my money on the road too, doing speeches and and panels, you know, and Mm -hmm. all that stuff has had to go online and not having that interaction with an audience. You know, I did um, a presentation for uh, a corporate audience the other day. And normally, you know, I would be able to look people in the eye and, you know, see if the room is getting uncomfortable and, and check the temperature on, you know, is my message landing? And, and you know, so not just the um, approval seeking, but but just, you know, understanding like, what do I need to adjust for next time, right? And, and only being reliant yeah. upon feedback from people that are kind enough to send a message or an email or to ask a question. Um, just something I've been thinking about a lot, and I'm sure yeah. you have been too. But what, I, um, what I want to play. What, what, what keeps me comfortable in all of this is that the world we're living in is the world that evolved after the Spanish flu, which was far worse, and far more deadly. So right. he still managed to have ju- joints after that shit. The need for human touch will eventually supersede any other reservations that people have, no matter what your political leanings are. Sooner or later, you got to get outside and have a drink and watch Lauren Hill not show up on time. It's inevitable. What do you, aside from being on stage, what do you miss most? Ooh, ooh. This is going to sound rude. Um, I miss travel. Um, Mm -hmm. I grew up an only child. And so being in the house constantly with people around the clock for five months straight 
not having those corners. Like, you can go take a walk. You can go excuse yourself for a couple of hours. But those two to three day stretches. Uh, and and were, how many people are in the just, house? There's. It's three total. It's me, her, and him. It's me, her, and the boy. So. Okay, the boy counts. I mean, we're drinking for the boy. I was trying to get boy, you to say a child. Okay, yeah, the child. You get what I'm saying. I think that I really took for granted how being alone, how much being alone and living in my head is part of my creative process and figuring out how to recreate that under quarantine has probably been the biggest hurdle. I finally figured it out. I think the trick is just late nights. You know, mm -hmm. you pick one or two nights a week where you just, you know, you just stay up late with this Go. PlayStation, watch a show, you know, do something. But you also have yeah. to make sure that you're feeding your relationship positively to afford yeah. those moments because you're not trying to create, you know, division in your home or to make someone feel excluded from your life. It's just, I don't know, right. it's just nothing right. I, I never noticed about me until I couldn't do it for the first time in 20 years. Right. That's interesting. Shout out to you for being in a relationship. Do you know who my emergency contact is? Me neither. Sometimes I just leave it blank. Um, but no, in all seriousness, I um, I will have to make a that. confession. Uh, it was a joke. I know we have a laugh. Come on now, Roy. Be, we would you, about would you, would be funny. It was literally meant to be funny. Right. No, the saddest thing ever is that there are... So like sometimes my emergency contact is my best friend who's in New York, but is also somebody I can trust to call the right family. You know what I mean? Who would know like which of my parents to get in touch with, which of my sisters, like this is a logical thinking person who can handle what happens if there's God forbid an emergency in which they have to be called. There are other times where, and there are times where I've listed one of my sisters, but the lowest moments where I'm like, yo, I actually need like an emergency, somebody in California, I've had to like put my baby daddy down. You know, and like these are for situations like where I'm somewhere where maybe my daughter would be there too. But I'm like, this is so, so basically nothing can ever happen to me wrong where they have to call my emergency contact because I can't be humbled in that. Or you are, and they see the ring like, oh, you must be her husband. No. <laughs> no, but I want to play a game with you, Roy. I want to make okay. sure you don't run out of time. Let's play a game. Okay. Let's play a game. Okay. So this game is called Can You Just Tell Me? And it is dedicated to my uh -oh. daughter. We take a drink for her. Uh, what is this? Well, you have a four-year-old. I have a seven-year-old. And so I'm you, but you, but I also know you're at the point where you're experiencing this. So children have a tendency at times where you can't just, an where you can only answer a quick question, right? A quick question will do. Like if the wedding is about to start and here comes the bride is queuing up, and they're sitting next to you and they want to ask you something, you have time to answer a quick question only, right? If the movie's about to start, whatever, you only got time for a quick question. Kids love to hit you with, can I ask you something real quick? But then the question's not quick at all. I'll give no, you an example. No. My daughter, we, uh, I took her to go see Alvin Ailey, which was such a big deal. Like I did not grow up getting Alvin Ailey tickets. This was like some new, new girl shit for me. I mean, I was familiar with Alvin Ailey, but like to yeah. go and see it with my it fucking child, you know? Yeah. To go and see, yeah, because um, Lisa Johnson, shout out to you, Lisa, one of my high school teachers is the director of adult programming at Alvin Ailey. So she gave us tickets. So I'm still not gonna say that I'm mature enough that I'm spending my money on Alvin Ailey tickets. I might be spending it on marijuana, but we went. <laughs> and we dressed up and we looked very nice. And so, it's about to start. And my daughter, she might have been five at the time. She looks over at me and she says, Mom, I have a quick question. Said, oh, no, no, I'm taking it back. It had already started. We've been watching for a few minutes. And then she says, Mom, I have a quick question. I was like, What? She was like, Why, when Michael Jackson was a little boy, he was black, but when he was an adult, he was white? And then the lights hit. <laughs> right. And then the crescendo and like the. You know, the spotlight uh, passes uh, over uh, us uh, audience. Uh, like, those are the two colored women that are uh, talking right now because she's also a woman at five. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to ask you some quick questions. And I want you to answer as many of them as quickly as you can in three minutes. Are you ready? Okay. Ready, ready. Quick answers. These are very quick questions. Okay? okay. All right. Starting now. Daddy, what is the moon? 
It's a rock that floats above the earth. Why do men have nipples? Um, you know, because sometimes they might need to to, to breastfeed. They we all start out the same, and then one of you gets a scrotum. What's a scrotum? Just this. Ask your mama. What's Donald Trump and why? Um. Well, you know, he's he's a he's a he's a he's a terrible monster that was sent here to make us grateful about things in life and hopefully we've learned our lesson and the monster will go back into the volcano what does life mean uh life is about figuring out a way to make yourself happy only to discover that the only way to make yourself happy is through yourself and not through other people and things and materialistic items that you're going to be bred over the next four decades to believe are the actual sources of happiness. Daddy, I don't know what any of those words mean. Good. And be quiet. The movie's starting. <laughs> Why can you drink beer and I can't? Uh, because it tastes nasty and it'll, get, it'll give you a stomach ache. Then why do you drink it? Do you like things that taste nasty? Do you like having stomach ache? Uh, and sometimes, yes, sometimes I do. Boy, go in there with your mama. <laughs> we'll stop there, Roy. That was excellent. You are ready for anything that parenting <laughs> throws at you. I'm so impressed. That was my, great. My, my, a my mom would have tried to give a real answer. <laughs> we're, your son. Um, we're, Shout we're out deep to your son. Uh, we're deep into everybody um, who's watching is drinking to your son, not just you, Roy. What's most importantly is that you all, all three of you that are watching this, are drinking right now. Um, my son is big into Venus fly traps and carnivorous plants now, and so I'm trying to explain okay. to him why Venus fly traps, and this is for real. You know, Venus fly trap, the animal, mm -hmm. an insect walks inside, hits two trigger hairs and it clamps shut and suffocates the animal and sucks the juices, right? Yeah. The Venus fly trap is open. It's waiting for something to touch the hairs. And my son turns to me and goes, when it rains, why don't raindrops trigger the trigger hairs and make it close during the rain? And I had nothing for him. I was like, That's because man, your you're son, right. your son is in 2025. No. Do you understand? He like is, that's some whole other like like that was on some mind. that was on some why do we park in driveways and drive on parkways level <laughs> that is impressive. But they start yeah. so early, like four, I'm telling you, like you know, everyone I know who has a three-year-old has said, like, no one told me that three was worse than two. People talk about the terrible twos. And it's like, yeah, the secret is that, like, it's like the beginning of terrible. It's like the door to the terrible exhibit opens. It's not like, whew, that year was really rough. It's like, no, the rest of your life is just terrible. Sorry, I hope you like cuddling yeah. your sweet little baby <laughs> from at this point. They're just, like, you know, antagonistic to you in, in most possible ways. But they're also yeah. so incredibly smart at four. And just watching them unlock all these little boxes is such a prize. I, um, yeah, at four, my fun. daughter became, my daughter's big obsession was New Edition. And she has not let this, because that's when the New Edition story aired, right before she turned four, actually. So her fourth birthday party was a New Edition theme party in which I had six of my homeboys be new edition and perform oh. including uh author michael denzel smith who's been on the daily show um oh, who was, no God. michael wasn't michael wasn't in the new edition michael was in the whiz for her third birthday party he played the 10 man but um but yeah no we had a whole performance like a, a brief reenactment of the new edition story mark lamont hill um was brooke payne the and it was like you got, you got motherfuckers coming over to your house Cosplaying ninety no, black, but you ain't got no emergency contact. Put them motherfuckers down. This wasn't. 
First of all, this wasn't at my house. This was at Rich Homie Mark's house because my apartment didn't have a rec room. So, <laughs> so like every black person who is Mark friends with Mark Mayo has had a party at that Negro's house. So shout out to you, Mark. We love you. Get better. Mark is sick with COVID. Um, just to show you how close and how real this shit is. But uh, we love you, Mark. Um, get better. And like I, I texted him the other, yesterday, you got to get better because Nick Cannon wants your spot. And what I will not allow, I will not allow Nick Cannon to become the voice for Black America. Not on my oh. watch. This is not going <laughs> to This is not going to happen. We've got so many options. Um, but yes, no, we did a whole 90, like my daughter's new addition shit is so consistent. And all these years later, I thought she would have moved on. You know, she goes through periods where she's like, I'm a little yeah. bit tired of listening to that. But typically like she doesn't disappear entirely. Like new edition on my Aaron Cloth, it's fine. Um, are all, they're always a factor. And like the other, a couple weeks ago, she was like, how do you think Bobby Brown is doing during COVID? But she was so convinced that other question. people had had this concern. Yeah, she was like, well, go on the internet and look and see. <laughs> <laughs> so I, see I'm, I'm cautious. <laughs> see if he posted it. Okay, Bobby, yeah. is she okay? No point yet where she's like, check his Instagram. She's like, search Bobby Brown. How is he doing during coronavirus? Because certainly other people have had this inquiry, and there's probably articles about it. Um, that's the level of her obsession, but also the seven-year-old processing of like the things that are important to me are important to the world. So I look forward to seeing what your son deems as the important, uh, oh my God, they told me not to move too much because my Wi-Fi was bad and I just saw that I, I froze for a moment and I looked like a Venus fly, fly, uh, fly trap. It was very creepy. Uh, it was like- So I, I just Googled how was Bobby Brown during coronavirus. <laughs> And uh, it's something about say? Millie Bobby Brown. It's Millie Bobby Brown from Stranger Things telling everybody to stay home and flatten the curve. So nothing about you. Bobby Brown. Right. I'm going to tell you, yeah. and then I'd like to hear you answer this question. Three things that Black folks were never supposed to allow to happen that we let happen. Number one, Kanye pulling up with Kim Kardashian. I feel like if we had been like, Nah, bro. Like, we could have saved that man's whole life, but that's a whole hour long special in and of itself. Number two, mm -hmm. there's a cosmetic company called Bobby Brown Cosmetics. How do we allow somebody, and it's a popular brand, how do we allow mm -hmm. somebody to be named Bobby Brown? That's like if I just started making Elvis Presley blunt raps. Like, I don't think that's fair. I think that's like complete. Oh, but, oh, but my name is also Elvis Presley, so it doesn't matter. It's like, Bobby with an I. Uh, and I only and I only defend this cosmetic company because there's a rocker, there's a rock star named Roy Wood, who I almost had to change my like performance name because this person was. A, I bet you the cosmetics company got away with it because it's Bobby with an I, and then it's cosmetics and Bobby Brown is music. So the copyright office was like, "Fuck it, y'all only do the same." Two I'm things. not even talking about the copyright because the law ain't never been in favor of the black man. I'm talking about the people. What I'm saying is if I came up with Axl Rose brand, I don't know, McDowell's. leggings or some shit. <laughs> right, right, McDowell's. Like, no, I'm saying an actual person's name. I'm like, this, this is, my name is Axl Rose and I sell shea butter. Like, the fans <laughs> of Axl Rose would be like, not on my watch. No, you don't. You better call it something yeah. else. And I'm saying that we, the fans of Robert Beresford Brown Jr., a.k.a. Bobby Brown, owed it to him, to New Jack Swing, and to the culture to have been like, no, you got to name yourself something else, like Lady Antebellum, when they decided to name themselves Lady A. And then that turned yeah. out to be a Black lady's name that they stole, but they did change it at least once. At least yeah, but I think, um, and then this. Okay, what's yeah. the third thing? Millie Bobby Brown. She has a name already. Okay, well then make that same argument for Michael B. Jordan. Should he not be Michael B. Jordan since we already got a Michael Jordan? Yeah. Michael Jordan, the first. Michael Jordan is mean and he got jaundice and his genes are about as wide as the racial wealth gap. And Michael B. Jordan looks like he could give fertilize one of these 
millennial eggs mm-hmm. I got mm-hmm. on How do we know for another three years. <laughs> How do we know that Millie Bobby Brown wasn't bullied into adding to Millie? She was probably just Bobby Brown when she was like a young actress just doing regular little fucking Snickers commercials and Nick Jr. shit. And then somebody was like, motherfucker, put a Millie in front of it before I beat your ass. And then she went and added to Millie. I hope so. I hope so. Or I hope that her parents named her an homage to the king of to the king of R&B. Nah, ain't no way. Ain't, they it's the Charlie Russell. Anytime a black, anytime somebody named their kid after a black person, they post about it and let you know. And then, this is, this is Kobe Usher T Boz, and we love him because those are three favorite black people. Black lives matter. We not sending Kobe Usher T Boz to Booker T Washington Elementary, but how soon? Matter. How soon until a white child is given? the name, a, a new white baby is given the name Black Lives Matter or BLM initials. And then the parents just go, this is our loving child, BLM. I'm pretty sure that Blair Lauren uh, Mitchell was born two weeks ago and you're just late because they haven't told us yet. <laughs> Now's the moment it's to coming. do it because like if you if you it's get pregnant coming. during the movement like 9 months later when they've like when they've moved on back to their regular nice white lives they're going to be over it but like right now I need a pre- you need a pregnant white woman who's just like full of emotions like you know what I'm naming my baby Brenda Lynn my baby <laughs> Nothing. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. so we have like four more minutes. This has been the most fun. It's been so much fun okay. because like I we don't have do you just you don't like we don't even have to have other guests for you can just like come back. Um yeah. because I don't have I a mean, life outside of quarantine. Well, you know what? I could come back every week and you could watch the slow deterioration of my relationship as I neglect my woman during the only time window where we have some one-on-one time because the kid wakes up at 8 o'clock and he don't fucking stop till like 7.30 or 8. No! I love your girl. She's so sweet. No, 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 no. She's so pretty. She's nice. She's She's black. So thank you. I like her so much. Please tell her I said hello. And listen. Why do you say thank you? Why you say thank, thank you? you? Because <laughs> on behalf of the Black woman delegation, I <laughs> love is love. Love is love. Uh, I live in LA. I live in LA now. I, you know what I've seen some shit, okay? I live in LA. Yeah. Like, it's kind of like, we like the, you know, we're less of like a priority and more so kind of like a there was nothing else open so i went to taco bell it's kind of how brothers regard us in certain circles here so what i'm I've saying heard, to you is the successful the you 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 already know so um mm-hmm. it's a lot of brothers in la that rather be with a white woman who looks like Polly shore than a black woman who looks like any of us so there's that um what I'm saying to you is thank you. This is a thank low moment in my me. life. The black women thank are gonna, you. no, no, no. This is, no, I've had, I've had enough of this alcohol. Thank you for loving a black woman. Thank well, you. You know what? Thank you for having me on. I love you as well. You are a black woman. Congratulations on thank this you. television family. program. Thank you. And it's not over yet though, because we have questions from the audience. That's what I was trying oh, to Oh, okay, to. my bad. You was acting all you had the dismount in your tone. I, thought, I was okay, no, okay. I was trying to give you I was trying to give you the light before we get to them. I want to affirm and thank you for doing this. But also we have these two questions. Yeah, um, all good, all good. So, all good. So uh the first one comes from Mahogany. Is this a good time to reevaluate standardized testing? I'd say so. Yeah. It gets not there's no real standard for it. And then also when you look at colleges and college admission, um, is it the California um, university system that decided to get rid of standardized testing earlier this year? They made that announcement. That was, I think, was so. one of the stories. I think it was I mean, anything before Kobe died. I just don't remember when it fucking happened. I don't remember. But no. it, it, we're definitely yeah, living I, I, in AK, like 2020 AK because there's before Kobe died and after Kobe died. And that is if a very serious way of looking at 
if you're going to still look at standardized testing as a way to advance students and you just have to cram for one big test that really doesn't prove your abilities in other quadrants of education, then fuck school altogether and just go take your GED in the seventh grade and just get into life as a 12 year old. Clock in. Because if you can pass the SAT, you may as well steady foot cram for the GED and just skip all this shit. I would say, logic, I by the way, I don't want any parent that's watching me right now to really go do that. Listen, yeah, yo, man. Donald Trump is the president. I feel like you could do any fucking thing. Who knows? Like, just throw some shit at the wall and see what sticks. I will say, standardized testing, as a kid, I, once I stopped enjoying school, I always did well in a standardized test. I did well in school. When I stopped giving a fuck about school, especially in high school, when I just wasn't interested anymore, my, my ACT, SAT scores were very high. My grades were very mediocre. You know, like I was just barely making it. Like I stayed at the B level and then like right when it mattered the most, I went down to like the 2.8 or something. Like low enough where you don't get scholarship money like you would have. I will say, I think the school should maybe be able to choose between the two, right? Like, are we looking at the standardized test and all the other stuff, meaning like your extracurriculars, your essay, your interview, or are we looking at the GPA and all the other stuff? But I don't think it needs to, I, I think that there should be a space in which you can evaluate the capability of it. But the standardized tests also have to be about capability as opposed to, did you go to a school where, like, for, you know, they use one of the big uh, critiques of the SATs is like, if you're using word problems or, or essay questions about lacrosse and giving this to kids who've never played lacrosse, you know, who have no con cultural context for these things, like, it, it's not going to be easy for them to complete this in the way that a kid who grew up around certain things would. Um, I, I think that a level, I think standardized testing could exist in a way that makes sense, but um it would still have to be there would have to be more than one it like the standard would still need to be based on a test that was culturally comprehend like culturally specific does that make sense Roy? like where it's like it we're, it we're checking sense, we're, we're evaluating your aptitude and your, yeah, capability, then, like your, your ability to process context but but the amount of work you would go into making one that's like written in language and, and written in, you know, the specificity that each test would yeah, need. Now you're getting into like cultural be. standard out. You got to get a black SAT and then you get a Latino right. SAT. Like that's right. No and then it's like, you need a, you books. need a West side oh SAT God. in Chicago. You need a South side yeah, SAT. You need it'll a, never happen. It's not going to happen. happen. It'll never happen. You know so happen. just let them, let them go. Um, when writing jokes, are there ever moments with content where you're like, oh, this is too soon? Oh, I guess something yeah. controversial yeah. or devastating, or do you Hell have yeah. that standard? Hell yeah. There's always a joke where you go, oh, that's funny. Let me wait a couple of months before I put that one out there into the universe. And if you think I'm dumb enough to give you an example right now after drinking vodka, you are wrong. Next question. Let's do one more. Can I say one more? I like this. Roy, what I appreciate about you, and one of the reasons that you are genuinely one of my favorite comedians, I'm not just saying that because you're one of the comedians that I know. And I'm like, oh, you, I asked you to do my show. You said, I'm gonna tell you one of my favorite. You were one of the first people, you were the first person I thought to reach out to because you are like seriously one of my favorite comedians. And part of the reason that you are is because, I mean, you're just funny as hell. And this is something that you have, even though they're not stand-up comedians, this is something that you all have in common, you and Jesus and Mero that Love you things. all can, cause y'all are of the same ilk in so many ways because you all can joke about anything. You never punch down. Y'all never punch down. And that's, so, and I that. think it's because like, yeah, there's a place for that. There's a need for that. And I think it's something that, you know, some of our best and brightest don't feel is, is worth tapping into or that it matters much. Right. And, and I don't understand that has to be everybody's approach, but I think that, you can talk about shit that's happening with groups of people that you're uncomfortable with, that you're not intimately familiar with, or even fond of, without punching down. You know, like like that's fine, like that's entirely feasible. But that you all are just so it's not about hey everybody, here's a sex positive feminist joke about women. You know, like there's not a performance of wokeness or or cultural sensitivity. It's just simply you're not punching down. Um, yeah, and I, I think that makes you very. Yeah, and What's still that? talking about the issues, and still and still going there and making people uncomfortable, but but not punching down, uh, and not just being fucking wildly misogynistic, which so many Gen X comics are. But you only had two years in the seventies 
to experience. So there might be a reason that you were not tainted in the way that some of your peers were. All right, so here's our last question. Um, last question. Sorrel wants to know, Sorrel wants to know, I'm assuming that's Sorrel uh, because you're in New York. Uh, one thing that you, Roy, would change about New York City? Well, I've only been living here five years. Um, so, you know, I'm not gonna go in on New York like I'm some sort of native with a bunch of gripes about it. Um, Income disparity. I mean, do we want to get woke on this? Because I could just say the police department. You know, that's an easy yeah. answer. Um, what's uh, a fun the quality, thing? What's to just make make New York City more Roy like? What's what's a give a light answer? Let's just more more pizza options than the flat large slice that y'all love so much. That isn't bad. But the problem with New here's the Overrated. problem. Y'all don't put the cheese on top of the pepperoni to hold the, the pepperoni in place. Cheese is a topping, but it's also a bonding agent, which means you can use the cheese by putting it on last to keep the toppings in place. So when I'm walking down the street eating this shit, it ain't falling off. That's my biggest gripe about New York slice. You know, you're not supposed to get a topping on. It's like, well, motherfucker, I want a topping on my slice, Sorrel. I know we just met, but I'm coming right at you. I change your pizza. And it's not that I hate New York pizza. It's just that the shit is assembled in the wrong order. Sauce. Toppings, I, cheese. That's how you do a slice of pizza. I did 13 years in New York. And so I feel more empowered to speak negatively on New York pizza. I'm also from Chicago. And I oh, worked at there we two go. pizza restaurants. And I worked at the pizza spot in high school. I worked with two of them. So what I will tell you <laughs> is that you're right. Sauce, toppings, cheese is a better, more effective, more flavorful way to experience. It's like people who don't know that you need to put like your your cheese right on top of your burger as opposed to like in between. You don't put the cheese on the bun and then put the ketchup yeah. and stuff in between, the right? It's just like you need hold certain the things bun in place on the top. All of the shit. Yes. So all whatever, of that. Man. But yeah. whatever. But what I'm going to tell you about New York pizza, y'all so stuck up and and it like honestly new york pizza is the emperor's new clothes if they were open in their hearts and minds to pizza from other places chicago pizza not even just deep dish it's also our thin crust like our thin crust which is thicker because we're thicker like and sometimes it does have cornmeal in it because we from the south and so we eat cornbread but like it's still, it's it's just the way that it's sauced and cheese and the quality of the cheese. New York pizza tastes like salt Listen, and hard I, times. I took that back, Sorrel. I'm sorry that I opened this can against your beloved New York City pizza. I, I was just talking about the construction of it. I find it fairly delicious. Uh, Jamila clearly has deep issues with the pizza. The cheese and is those, mediocre. Those views do not represent my views of those at the Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Viacom, CBS. Those are Jamila's views alone, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this happened. This is my, the show is over, but this is my final question. I was going to ask you this earlier. Do you ever get tired of saying the with Trevor Noah part? Not like because of Trevor, but just because that's so many words. Sometimes, but the boy earned it. So, you know. Say the whole thing. It's just a long name. It's a long name. It, no, but it's the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, the Daily Show with Trevor Noah, the Late Show with Stephen Cove. It was the name of the host is always attached to the name of the show because y'all need to recognize who the hell is sitting in the chair. Because if I if I have a wholesome <laughs> shit, you best believe it is going to say with Roy Wood Jr. Okay, what's the name That's of your show? True. We're leaving right now. What's the name of your show? Blank with Roy Wood Jr. Your magic, your show right now. What would it be called? Shit, it might be called Wild and Out if they keep it going without <laughs> Nick Cannon. That's just I'm being silly. I'm I, being silly. I would love to watch Gen X Wild and Out. I'm we too old. Out, we ain't got that Roy energy. Wood Jr. If you did Wild and Out with forty year olds, that shit would be an eight minute show. We tired. I ain't got all that that lung stamina to be rapping. Them kids is talented. That's why they got youth on that show. Nick Cannon knew what he was doing. Let me get out of here before I get a call from Viacom. Okay. Uh, shout out to Viacom. We love you.
Roy, I love you. Thank you so much. Thank you to your woman for loaning you to us during this uh, hour and night where the time where the, the little one is asleep. Shout out to your baby for being four. I definitely still thought he was like two and a half. And thank you for being the first ever guest on The Kids Are Asleep. Well, I'm love pu- it, I'll love put it, this on it. your wiki page. I'll put it on your okay. wiki page. Put it on the wiki page Thank and change so my uh, place of birth back to Birmingham just to keep people fighting. I will do that. <laughs> I will do that. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. Have a good night, and we will see you next week unless the president of Slate watched this and was like, absolutely not, in which case, I'm so sorry. Good night. Thank you.